Hello again, and welcome back to Nonprofit Marketing with Purpose. My name is Monica Pitts, and I once again have my special guest with me, Stacy Brockmeyer. Because we are gifting you with the second installment of the website planning series. So this is part two, and today we're going to talk about your nonprofit web building checklist. So that way you don't miss anything as you're getting started with your new site. So we're going to talk to you about creating your website plan, making decisions about your team roles, and then also some technical things that you probably need to discuss with your developer or, I mean, if you are the developer, then I guess you'll be tackling these on your own, but at least you'll have a list, right? All right. So let's get to business. You're on a mission and you just need more people to know about it. And whether you're brand new to marketing or a seasoned pro, we are all looking for answers to make marketing decisions with purpose. I'm Monica Pitts, a techie, crafty business owner, mom, and aerial dancer who solves communication challenges through technology. This podcast is all about digging in and going digital. I'll share my marketing know-how and business experience from almost 20 years of misadventures. I'll be your backup dancer so you can stop doubting and get moving towards marketing with purpose. I am so excited to be talking about websites again today. (laughs) I honestly wonder when people listen to these website podcasts, if they're just like, what in the world is going on? But uh, so we decided to do this series because I was in my consulting sessions and I was supposed to be talking about marketing, but everybody kept asking me about websites and I was overjoyed to talk about it, quite frankly. And then I thought, well, geez, maybe I need to talk more about websites. And so here we are, right? I love talking about websites. It feels like the base. It feels like the start of where like where it all begins. Well, yeah, that's because everybody needs to have a marketing home. And in our universe, your marketing home is your website because it's the thing that you have the most control over. So it would make sense that we have to have a great plan to make sure that this website comes off without a hitch. Well, I say without a hitch, but like what website ever comes off without a hitch? Does anything in life come off without a hitch? Because I'm just getting used to the fact that there's going to be something with everything. Yeah. Yeah. So (laughs) Stacey has this great analogy that she talks about with people about planning their website. And she think she talks about it like it's like building a house. I do. I equate it a lot to the construction process because typically people have built something in their life, whether, or they, whether it's a house or what something else, but it's often something that people can grasp because the website process is really an intangible Mm -hmm. thing. You can't touch it. You can't touch it. You can't see it until it's like literally up in front of you. And so I love equating it to building something because it's a tangible process that people can understand. And one of the things and the reason why this episode today is so important is that waiting until it's up in front of you to really think about it. And so many people do this. I cannot tell you how many people do this. So scary. Their website is never real to them until they can physically touch it with their mouse, right? And that is too late, my friends. Like so much of the hard work has already been done, which is why it's so important to go through these steps that we're going to talk about today to make sure that you can actually check off all the boxes on this checklist before you even get started, really. Um, because the worst, it's the worst when when you have to go do, re, re, well, redo, re, to do in the overs, when you have to do it over. <laughs> Gotta love when you when you have to redo redo the overs. <laughs> oh, we spend too much time together. Okay. So for those of you who are building your first website, for those of you who are thinking about redoing your website, or for those of you who hate parts of your website and have been tasked with figuring out how to fix them, this is for you. Or even if you have a website and you don't know if it's good or not, boom. It's for you too. Yeah. So first, Stacey, kick us off. Why don't you go ahead and give us, like, step under the pulpit and give us the thing that we always need to hear first. So you know that the thing that we beat over everyone's head in everything is review your audience. So oftentimes I do the things that we did in 
website planning series part one, episode one, the last episode of our series, and the things in this series at one time. But if you are separating them like we have in these episodes, you're going to go back to the things that you did last time and review your audience. Who are we talking to? Because it's going to be super essential to keep them at the forefront of your mind. They really are the things that help you make decisions. That and your goals as an organization. Those things are, they should be your guiding principles in why you do what you do. And while we talk about team roles a little bit later in this episode, realize that if you're not the team leader, then it's even more important that you understand what the team leader's view is on your audience and the goals of your organization and how this website is going to help you achieve them because that will help you help them make the right decision. Because sometimes as a decision maker, I can say this with utmost confidence, we do not have our head in the right place and we're not making the right decision right now. And we need somebody to be like, no, 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 no. Flip it on its head. Think about it this way. Remember what we talked about to begin with? Is that still what you want? And if so, you're failing. (laughs) You're not the only person who needs to know your audience. Your web developer, if you've hired someone, needs to know who you're talking to. So if they didn't ask you and they didn't get clear on who you're talking to, make sure they know too. Yeah. So... First and foremost, review your audience. And I mean, obviously, to understand your goals as an organization and how your website is going to help you reach those goals. So then thinking about your website plan. So whenever you get ready to build a house or remodel a house, you have a blueprint, right? And your website plan is like your blueprint. It's going to help guide you through this project. The problem is that the project doesn't happen overnight most of the time. If it's a bigger site, it takes a while to build and you forget, you lose track of what decisions were made earlier and later. And you need something that's going to guide you through the process to make sure that you're not doing it wrong, you know, because someone might remember one detail and you don't, and then you kind of look like a bozo when it all comes down to it. So what do you do first whenever you're creating a website plan for someone, Stacey? Well, I typically start with outlining the pages. Mm-hmm. And so you can kind of think about like that, like listing out the rooms that you need in your house. It's the same kind of concept. So what do you need as far as the pages go and what's going to be on each page? I always start everyone off with a home page. And a contact page. Like I just put home at the top of the list and I put contact at the bottom of the page. And now we're going to fill in every other page in between. I always put about in there too, because everyone needs some sort of about page. Depending on the organization, we'll determine what is going to be on that about page. But everybody needs to be able to tell who they are. And then other common pages are... What we do, what is your cause, fill in blank, your cause, services provided, and the page for each of your services. If you do trips, if you're doing projects, if you have sub causes, events, news, donate. Oh, for heaven's sakes, I can't tell you how many nonprofit websites I look at that don't have a donate button on the main navigation. And the first thing I tell them is, donate needs to be very bright and needs to be up at the top. I know I sound like I'm talking to a toddler right now, but like we need their donations. Yep. We got to have money to do what we need to do. Got to help people. Don't and it cost money. Don't make them dig for it. Friends. Don't put it underneath. Get involved. No, 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 no. It can be underneath the get involved section too, but it needs to be up and on the main navigation. Donate. So then ways to give careers, if that's part of your setup, a privacy policy. We can talk a little bit more about those when we get to technical components and then a contact page. And so the contact page, that sucker should also be on the main navigation. Some people don't feel like they should have it up there. And I, I really think that there are not a lot of nonprofits out there who are not asking for donations from people of a a generation that was not raised with the internet, right? Like I wasn't raised with the internet and I'm only 40. So that means that there's a lot of people that you're asking for donations from that were not raised with the internet. It's not that they can't figure out how to contact you. It's that having that contact page on your main navigation is like, it's respectful to them, right? Don't make them dig for it. (laughs) 
<laughs> Stacy's like, she's breathless over here. She's like, no, what? You, like, why? I'm telling you, Stacy, I've been reviewing their websites and they don't have it. It's so sad. I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to drive the point home <laughs> that they need to be able to donate. They need to be able to contact you. So, so important. So if you want to have a list of each one of these pages that we just listed off, you can get them in our perfect nonprofit website ebook. And you can download that at maycreate.com. And it's going to take you through all the different pages and what to think through for each page, what to put on them. And we're going to go over it too in the rest of this website planning series. But just so you know, that list is available to you for free at maycreate.com. Click on nonprofit resources. Boom. You can have it. Fabulous. Okay, so what is the next thing we need to think about when we're creating our website plan? Well, we're going to get into content. So content is a couple of different things. It's the words that go on your pages and the photos that go on your pages. So, so many of us are visual. So let's talk about the visual first. Do you have photos? Where do you get them? So, (laughs) so (laughs) many people, companies, organizations myself included, where are my pictures at? I don't even know. So do we have them? How do we gather them? And if we don't have them, are we going to use stock photos? Yeah. And if you, you know that you have original images, part of your website plan needs to be finding them and getting them together. If there's a certain place on your website that you want them to be, you can group them into folders. Like I find that's usually the easiest for me, just having a belt folder and all the pages that might work on, or all the pages, all the pictures that might work on your about page, you just put them all in that folder. That way you know, and it's easier to give that to your web developer because then they have a very clear path. We don't know who Chris is. You know, you know the one with Chris on the roof? It's like, no, I, I don't know. There's like 10 people on the roof in different pictures. I don't know. And so I'm just, I always feel stupid. And we had one guy, remember when we had the equipment sales guy? that we built his website for him. Hi, Jay Buckman. I remember you. And um, I mean, he'd be like, the, no, Monica, the loader. And I'm like, huh. Well, this one has a bucket on it. <laughs> Seems <laughs> like, like it could be a loader. Maybe. Yeah. So some degree of organization for that is important. The other thing to consider is what types of pictures or what are the style of photos that you want to use on your website. So do you want to have people or no people? So some organizations help people with grief and maybe they don't want to have really sad looking people all over their website. Yeah. I, I, and it, like ASPCA. Eh. Am I, like, that's, a, that's yeah. the sad animal people, right? Yes. So every photo on their website is a sad animal. But we have clients who help people like with mobility who can't walk and they make these carts for people in third world countries who can't walk. None of their photos make you feel sad. Like that is part of their guide. When they talked to us, they were like, we want everything to feel uplifting because what we're doing is we're helping these people have a better life. We're not, we don't want you to feel sad for them. We want you to celebrate their new life with them and their new freedom and their ability to, to get around. So we do have an episode that's all about photos. So you can hop back over and listen to that. But yeah. Really think about the message you want your pictures to send because so many people are super visual. You know what? I just realized that I think we got a little bit ahead of ourselves here because we have not explained to you yet how we actually keep all this information together in some type of fashion to use. We call a website plan that we make for a client our working document for the project. It is the blueprint that we follow, right? And we actually do this in a Google Doc and we share it with all the members of our team. And in that Google Doc, you will see information about the creative. You would might see information about the audience so that way we can keep them front and center. You would see the goals for the website and you would also see each page that we would put on the website listed on the document and then underneath each page we have a paragraph that describes what's going to be on the page it could be a paragraph it could be a bulleted list but basically it's an outline of what content would go on that specific page of the site and the other thing 
is each page that has functionality or some way for people to interact with it. So like an email form, or maybe they can sort and filter, maybe they can input stuff into the website. That functionality is documented all in this website plan or what we call our working doc. So as you're going through, ask yourself, what content would you be updating frequently in the site? So for example, if you had a news page and you're going to update the content on your news page frequently, then you would want to document how you plan to do that because there's ways that you can make it really easy for people who aren't tech savvy. And we talked about in the last episode, like allowing your volunteers to submit articles to you from the front end of the website so they never have to log in and start that process there and lightening your workload for you. Um, but you need to build that into your website so that it's streamlined and it's not overly clunky. So one example of this is way back in the day, I built an auction website. And every time there was an auction sale, we mentioned on it on four different pages on the website. And we also had a page for each auction. And I had to go to each page of the website and update it with the information about this auction sale. Now, Have I mentioned to you that I am not super detail-oriented? Do you know how many times I forgot one of the pages, like to update one of the pages, and the client would call me and be like, oh my gosh, Monica, you forgot to update this one page. It's got the wrong auction on it. Well, that's the type of thing that your website should be doing for you. You shouldn't have to go to four different pages and update the information on there. So finding a way to build it in a streamlined fashion is going to make you so much happier as a user of your website on the other end, because your website shouldn't just be easy for your visitors to use. It should be easy for you to use. (laughs) Otherwise, you're not going to update it. No. It really is going to fall to the bottom of the list. Absolutely. Or you're going to update it by doing things like putting a bunch of PDFs on it. (laughs) And then the links are going to be broken. Yeah. (laughs) Yay! It's going to happen. Yes. Um, so speaking of that heavy lifting, that that wow phase that we talked about in our last episode where you think of all the ideas of how you can use your website to lighten your workload, this website plan, it's when you're going to move into the how phase to figure out how exactly you're going to do it. Stacey, take us through some of the things that you think about and some of the activities that you do during the how phase. So one of the biggest pieces, and I think the most um, time consuming, if you will, or the most labor intensive pieces of planning your website is researching any integrations with other platforms that you're going to use. How does that integration actually work? Is it streamlined? Is it really functional? What is it that we're actually integrating? Is it actually going to make your life easier or is it going to add extra steps? And then is it cost effective? Now this next piece. <laughs> and I, and we have this nervous laughter because, um, I mean, you know, well, it happens. Is it stable or do you have to force it to work? Because there are lots of times where there's a platform that says, oh, yeah, we integrate with X. And then it's finding a whole bunch of workarounds that actually work together. And then if one little piece updates, everything crumbles. And so that makes it really difficult and really time consuming. And so at that point, are you better off doing it manually, which is also really time consuming and terrible? Or is there another way that could be better? So we want to make sure that it's really stable and really functional. And it's going to last a long time, too. We don't want to have to redo it over and over and over again. So a few tricks that I've found for figuring out whether integrations are really going to work or not is look for documentation, how it's actually going to work. Because most of the time, if it's going to integrate, they should be giving you documentation to do it. And even if you don't understand what that documentation says, if there are a thousand pages of documentation on how to integrate something, odds are pretty good that if you've got a smart web developer, they can probably make that happen. So that's something I always look for is documentation for how it's going to work. If there's nothing there that documents it, then you need to reach out to the help people for the software and be like, how can this work? Please send me the thing that my web developer needs to see. And I know, Stacey, you've sat in so many conversations with clients to evaluate stuff like this for them. Right. 
Yeah, absolutely. And also, how old is that documentation? Oh, yeah. How, like, if it's from 2010, then we might want to rethink it because likely something has updated since then. And two, if you know you really want to integrate this and you don't have your system already, you might consider working with your web developer to make sure that you're when you're picking a new platform that it really does integrate the way you want it to because there are some that really integrate nicely and there are others that just don't work quite as well. Yeah, I think my last piece of advice would be if you're using a WordPress site and it says that it integrates with WordPress, you should be able to find a plugin. It almost always integrates through a plugin. And if it doesn't integrate through a plugin and it just integrates through what they call an API, then you might need to have a really smart developer to make it work. Mm -hmm. So just basically what I'm saying is bring your developer in and make them talk to the smart people about the stuff. You don't even have to know the words. You just you just patch them through together and you let them talk and you listen and you think, wow, these people are just talking about something I don't understand. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because at the end of it, they'll know whether or not it works. And we do so much of that that it's just heartbreaking when people come to us and say, hey, this is really going to work. And it turns out, no, it's really not. It doesn't work at all. And now they have all this extra work to do and they picked the system because they thought it worked, but they didn't bring us in to begin with. And so now they're being let down and they have double the work. Yeah, it's super disheartening when that happens. So other things that you want to do, like beginning with the end in mind, right, are make some decisions on ADA compliance and SEO. So ADA compliance for some nonprofits is really important because it allows people to use a screen reader to go through your website. There's just certain criteria that you have to meet to have an ADA compliant website. It's easier to do it as you go than it is to go back and do it later. You will inevitably miss, you will miss something. It is very time consuming to go back and do it later. We've done it many times. It's just very time consuming. So if this is something you need, I think you should let your designer know to begin with. It's absolutely super important. And the other thing I would mention is decide what pieces are super important because there are pieces of ADA compliance that are going to be more important to some organizations than others. And and some are going to be say it has to be 100%, but understanding what that means. And also understanding that if you do want to be 100% ADA compliant, then you are going to give up some of the things that you might have wanted. You maybe maybe you didn't want them. But like for example, an auto playing video on your homepage is not an ADA compliant feature. So you would give that up. But knowing that to begin with would mean that you didn't pay hundreds if not thousands of dollars to have a professionally edited video to put on your homepage because ADA compliance is more important to you than a homepage video. So just thinking through that to begin with. And the other thing that we like to think about to begin with as well is search engine optimization. Stacy, tell us about that. Well, I was actually going to ask you about it because oh. talk to us about how you got a website to rank 20 years ago. Tell us, <laughs> tell us what people did 20 years ago when they, they got a website to rank. So you would figure out the words that people were searching for, and then you would put it all over the website. It was like keyword puke. It was just blah, 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 over and over and over again. You just like stuffed it like a turkey. Yeah, yeah, so many. And my dad was actually telling me the other day that that's how you get sites to rank. God bless him. He owns an internet service provider. He doesn't build websites. He doesn't know. I have this conversation so often where people want to just stuff their website with keywords because that is how you used to do it. But mm-hmm. really, over the last, what, three to five years, Google has really changed the game. Mm-hmm. And so they really want to put the emphasis on the user interface, the user perspective. So tell us a little bit about that. So there's a lot of different things that make your website rank in Google. Mm -hmm. And one of the ones that people overlook the most often is something that's really natural, which is where you're located. Mm -hmm. And so it is going to be difficult for you to rank nationally if you're not doing something like blogging, because you in blogging can catch very, very specific questions and answer them. And those specific questions are going to be easier to rank for than just general services. So I do think it's still important to some degree to have keywords correctly on your website because if you never refer to something at all, 
Google might not draw the line and connect the dots. They might, though. They might. Um, But in general, what you're trying to do is create original content that will keep people on your site and moving from page to page because that shows Google that you have a quality website. And bringing people back to your website is another indicator to Google that you have a quality website. So it's more and more what's in your website and how much you cared about it like each individual page and how well you set it up for people to navigate between between the pages than it is those specific words. Now, like I said, though, I would still have the words, but it does they don't have to be there like repetitively, grossly the way that they used to be. And you're not going to like hide them in the background. Oh, no. People like I still have people that ask me, oh, can't we just hide this in the background? <laughs> like make it the same color? No, no, <laughs> no we can't. <laughs> I do think, too, something that people don't realize is that part of the your website score with Google is literally how it's built. Yeah. So from a technical perspective. And how fast it loads. And the other thing is that your website's really only about half your score with Google. Yeah. So there are lots of other things that affect your SEO just as much as your website. Mm-hmm. Or I say as much. There are other things that add up to affecting your SEO as much as your website. But knowing what your goals are with search engine optimization before you start building your site are important because you want to understand what those keywords that people are searching for actually are. You want to plan for pages that are going to help guide people through that decision-making journey. And I mean, if you don't research it first, then your, your answers will not be there. Now, I have a couple of other podcasts about search engine optimization. I mean, I have to. How would I not have them? That would be so weird. I know. I feel like we could talk about it forever. I know. And we're just like bunny trailing. Okay, so So, back to the top, though, with creating your website plan. Once again, we do this in a Google Doc. You're going to outline your pages, describe what's going to be on each, describe the functionality on each page. What are people going to be able to do? You're going to figure out what types of photos you want to use and what style they are. Think about the content that you'll update frequently and try to streamline that process as much as possible through programming. Research the integrations with the platforms that you plan to use and make sure that it can actually work and save you time and is cost effective. Make any decisions about ADA compliance up front and search engine optimization up front because it's easier to do those things and not retrofit them in the long run. So now you understand what goes into this website plan, right? But The website plan, like the technical execution of how the website might be built, is only part of getting it done. There is a group of people that are going to work together, or maybe it's just you all on your own. You are an amazing human being, and you can do it, okay? You can do it! Um, But in most cases, there's a team of people working to get it done. So in order to actually complete the website, you have to understand what everybody's doing on that team. Like, what is their role? Let's get the right seats on the right bus with the right humans in them. Now, Stacey, I know that there's a question that you ask in every sales meeting. What is that question? Tell me about your decision-making process. And what I'm looking for is, ultimately, who needs to be involved in it? How is it going to go? I can't tell you how many times that the right people aren't involved at the very beginning because it's so important that they get involved so that we are moving forward in the right direction. I know that you've heard this story and and you were part of it, but there was... There, actually, more than once, there have been a couple websites where we, we talk about this very, very directly at the beginning of the process and say, okay, we need to get the right people on on board. Oh, no, no, no. That person doesn't need to be involved. That they're, It's okay. They don't care. And then we'll launch the website. And then all of a sudden, that person really cares. The wor- I think the one that was like the most, that stands out the most was there was a mom and a family business that they, oh, mom doesn't care what the website's like. That was well, her son saying that. Like, so it was like the mom... Like the dad and the son ran the family business. The son came into the family business. He was making the decisions. And then the mom saw the website. Go on, Stacey. Turns out she really cared. 
she really, really cared and she really, really didn't like his decisions. And it, it ultimately had to be rebuilt. And that wasn't free for them because we had fulfilled our part of the contract. And I mean, we did do what we could, obviously, to help them out. But it's so important to get everyone involved up front. And if someone who is a decision maker isn't going to be involved in a step in the process that they are very aware and the conversation is had that if they're skipping their meeting or they're skipping their decision making in that step that the project is going on without them and they're relinquishing that control. It's a fun conversation to have. Insert eek here because it is scary. (laughs) Um, Nervous laughter, nervous laughter. But it is way better to look your boss in the face and say, so I get to make all the decisions about the the things that we talk about today. And they say yes. And then you say, and you know that if you want to change any of these things in the future, you're going to have to pay more money. And they say yes. And you've got permission. That's like your, I mean, you're just covering your behind, really. You don't want them to come back and yell at you about something that ultimately they stepped out of. So just making sure that you have all the right decision makers on board from the beginning is key. And then two, we have people in our company that we call project managers. They're the leader of the project. So they're the they're the one who gets it done, make sure that it happens. And you should definitely have one of them on your side too. Yeah. They're like so if there's seven people involved in the project from the client's end, there's one person who communicates amongst all of them and then comes back to us with the decision. So delegate that person. What happens if you don't have that person is there's just a billion emails. And no one really knows what decision has been made. And then work might happen on your website that you weren't really anticipating. And then you're just going to have to redo it. So just finding that clarity within yourselves as a group and then going to the person who's doing the work and delivering that decision to them. They're the chairperson of your website committee. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. One of the pieces that is, I feel like, the hardest part through the entire website process is writing the initial content. Yeah. So the role of the person who's writing the initial content, who is that? Is it you? Is it the design company? Is it someone on your team? Is Is it it a volunteer? Multiple people on your team? Mm Mm-hmm. So definitely deciding who is taking on that responsibility. And if you're a really big organization, you may have a person from each department or service line or, you know, part of your organization writing their own piece. But then the same person should be editing all those pieces. So let me explain that in another way. If three different people are contributing content for the website, there should be another one person that is editing all their content. You can really see this come through in in bios. If you read one person's bio, they refer to themselves as their name and they talk about themselves in third person. And then you read another person's bio and they talk about themselves in first person. I did this, I did that. And they might be much more fun in it. Well, what we want to have between the pages of your website is consistency. You need to say your name the same way every time, whether it's gonna be first completely listed out and then abbreviated second and just make sure that you're capitalizing each subtitle the same way. All these pieces of consistency, they develop a professional product that makes people feel comfortable and builds credibility for your organization. So having that person in charge of editing everything, that same person is important, very important. And also deciding who is going to update content in the long run that changes frequently on your website as well as who is going to do the technical maintenance on your website ongoing. So those are things that will have to happen after your website is live. So technical maintenance, meaning software updates, and hopefully that's not you. It should ultimately be your hosting company or your web developer. Yeah, so double check on that hosting company to see if they do any of those updates for you. Some do, some don't. Even if you have to pay a little bit more to get a hosting company that does, 
it is worth it because the way that websites get hacked is by letting the software that they're built on expire. I don't know. Like, like there's updates made to it continually when bugs or gaps are found in it. And if you're not continually updating it, then you have a vulnerable version of a website that someone can reach in and hack. I mean, it's ultimately just like a PC. If you're a PC user, that Windows updates regularly. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're doing is they're patching security holes so that people can't get into your computer. It's definitely worth the little bit of extra money to have a hosting company that'll do some of that stuff for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Okay. So just to recap that, team role decisions, right? Once you have your website plan made, we need to go to the team to make sure that we can get the job done, right? So understanding who's involved in the decision-making process, choosing a leader for your team, and that's not necessarily the head honcho. This is the person who's going to make sure the project gets done, who organizes the communication and keeps track of everything, Deciding who's going to write the content for your pages, deciding who will update the content that changes frequently, and then understanding how you'll get that technical maintenance accomplished, whether it's through a service that your hosting company offers or something that your web developer offers. I mean, if you do decide to do it yourself, that's okay too, but there's a very systematic process, which I will not explain to you right now that you should go through to do it because otherwise, my friends, you're going to break things. You're going to break things. And then you're going to call me anyway, and I'm going to have to charge you to fix it. Don't Not that I'm things. your, like, don't, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. Watch some YouTube videos first. <laughs> Figure out how to do it right. Okay. So part of your website plan has to be the plan to, like, get it done, like, on a timeline, right? So what's a typical timeline, Stacey, that they could be looking at? Well, 90% of people call me and want their website done yesterday, not a good timeline. Just so we're <laughs> so we're clear. Not a good timeline. Usually takes about three months to go from start to finish on a website because there is that content gathering. There's design that needs to happen. There's research. All of those things that need to be implemented to make it happen. So plan on at least three months to build your website. And that's with a web designer who is dedicated to building it for you. If Absolutely. you're doing it on your own and you haven't done it before, or you have other responsibilities in your job, you might need to give yourself as much as six months or a year to get it done. It's just important that at the beginning, you set a timeline so that way when you go through your site plan, you can figure out what's going to happen when and give yourself some deadlines along the way to make sure it actually happens. Okay, so you have your timeline, and then we also have some technical pointers for you. And we're going to not go into these super, super deep because, well, quite frankly, some of them just, it's something that your web developer should be handling for you. But I do want you to know about this so that way you can go to your web developer and make sure that they actually happen. Um, So Stacey, tell us about the first one. The first one we listed on our list was mobile design. Your website really needs to be mobile friendly. If it's not, then you're really doing yourself a disservice. You're doing your viewers a disservice. And quite frankly, Google just doesn't like you. Yeah, that's so true. (laughs) Everybody wants to be liked, even if it's by Google, I think. I don't know. Sometimes... Google. They're the internet gods. Yeah. So, I mean, I would like to have the internet gods look favorably upon me, yeah. right? So make sure that your website is mobile friendly. There's actually a Google mobile friendly test that you can run to make sure that it's truly mobile friendly. Yes. And I would not be as concerned about mobile first design. Those are buzzwords that you hear. I mean, in our office, we always start with the most complicated thing first and usually the most complicated layout is the one that you see on a desktop, but we test it on mobile each step of the way. Mobile tends to be the simplest layout that you're looking at. So it's not so much that you design mobile first. You should code mobile first because it's the simplest. But when you design, we like to start with the most complicated thing and then take out the elements to make it simpler for a mobile view. The next piece is that piece that you can't see. Nobody can see it, so it's super intangible It that your website loads fast and is built correctly from a structural perspective. 
<laughs> so remember earlier when I said part of uh, your search engine optimization is how quickly your website loads? And I said people going to multiple pages, staying on your website for a while. Well, if your website doesn't load quickly, it automatically decreases all of the indicators to Google that you have a quality site. So it's really important. Um, A few things to know about because I spent like weeks figuring out more and more about this, this like last year during COVID, I was like, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. I was, I was holed up in my basement and I was like, our sites aren't loading fast enough. That's it. And then every day I would like show Stacy the new scores that I got for people as I was optimizing things. Totally dorky. Um, and honestly, if you're concerned about how your website loads, you can go on to the nonprofit marketing with purpose, Facebook group and, please like make a post, tell me about it. And I will go run a report for you and explain to you what it means. I'm not going to charge you for it. Everybody needs to understand this stuff. And the easiest way for them to learn is by watching other examples. So things to look out for are page builders. Um, Ask your web developer about page builders. If they use one, it will slow things down, period. Not going to go into it any further than that, but just know that that's something that you should know. Especially if you're in a rural area and the people that are looking at your website don't have great internet, or if they're always on a mobile phone, that page builder can really slow things down. I mean, using tons of plugins will also slow things down. Caching, make sure that they're installing a caching plugin. I'm not going to explain what it means, but just know the word caching. We will talk about it later, I'm sure. And then if you want to go run a report, you can go run a report on your website using, I call this, I, I call this guy my boyfriend, my boyfriend GT Metrics. Have you heard me talk about him before? When I found GT, the whole sky opened up. I got a rainbow, a unicorn crossed my path. GT is so cool. Monica swoons <laughs> over GT. I feel like he like wears a muscle shirt and like has really good abs. He's I don't so know. so strong. There's so many reports that'll tell you stuff, but they don't make any sense. And I'd been running these reports and reading them and, and just Google searching every word in them, trying to really comprehend everything that was going inside of them. And then I got to GT. I'm telling you, he's free. Mm-hmm. GT is free. My man's free. Go out and check out GT I Metrics. Know. I don't think you want a free boyfriend. That's scary. <laughs> um, well, when it's as good as GT Metrics is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then um, browsers. Okay. So remember how we talked about how your computer updates and how your website is going to update. Well, browsers update too. And so understanding how far back you need to optimize for in a browser, it's just so much easier to know at first because otherwise you could spend forever optimizing for different browsers. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So just think about that ahead of time and and update all the browsers that you're running. Just do it. It's a good plan. It's going to make you more secure. Please don't run these old pieces of crap. It will, your website will be crappy then too because it will be on a crappy browser. So update stuff and make yourself happy. <laughs> um, okay. So Stacy, there's a couple other things that they have to like purchase or set up. Yep. Take us through those. So choosing a domain name, one that's easy to spell, one that's easy to remember, super important. Choose a good registrar that's easy to work with. My personal favorite right now is GoDaddy like that for domain registration, not for a lot some other things, but for domain registration, super easy to work with, very functional. Your domain is your web address. Yep. So like that is create.com. My name.com. Yep. Then you need an SSL certificate. I'm not going to go into what an SSL certificate is, but it encrypts your website files and you have to have one. Make sure that your hosting provider has one for you or that you have your web developer puts one on your website. As a matter of fact, go out to your website right now. And look and see if there's a little padlock in the corner in front of your domain name or your web address. If there's not a padlock there, then you do not have an SSL certificate. If you do not have HTTPS 
in front of your domain name, if you copy and paste it into like an email or something, you don't have an SSL. So you really, really do have to have one and it needs to be on like every page. Google gets real angry at you if you don't have it. Yep. You have to choose a hosting provider. Your hosting provider matters. Mm -hmm. I can't say it enough. I think I could talk for like three hours about how your hosting provider matters. Make sure you're choosing somebody super reputable, somebody that you can actually get a hold of, somebody who keeps their servers up to date that is not going to stop your website from loading fast. It's super important. Choose a great hosting provider. Somebody who has a phone number on their website. If they don't have a phone number on their website, it doesn't matter how cheap the hosting account is, it's not worth it because you can't call them when something's wrong. And if your email is tied to your domain name, you can't even email them when something's wrong. The cheapest hosting provider is not the best choice, let me tell you. This is a place where you do not want to get the cheapest one. And make sure they have technical support in your time zone. Yes. Yep, yep. Then cookie pop-ups. I'm sure everyone has seen the, I want to allow cookies. I don't want to allow cookies. Man, we have a whole series on that as well. I think we could talk about it for hours again. It's my very first episode ever. What's all this cookie business? You can go listen to it. It was so much fun. Go listen to it. It's not as scary as one might think when you're reading the um, little notifications, but... Yeah, you need to have a cookie notification and you need to have a privacy policy. Both of those are really important on your website. Yes, and everyone needs to have a privacy policy. Everyone does, especially if you're going to use Google Analytics for tracking, you have to have one. And then for the cookie pop-up, if you're in California or you do a lot of business with California or if you're over in Europe, you like it is mandated you have to have one to protect people's privacy. But that doesn't mean that everyone else isn't already taking steps to comply. And that legislation is just going to it's going to sweep across the world. So make sure that you're doing it. Your website already serves in those locations most likely if you look at your analytics and You have to comply with their laws or you need to block the people in those locations from seeing your website. Yeah, that's one way to handle it. Which doesn't sound like a good idea, in my (laughs) opinion. I I would not recommend that. (laughs) So just get that cookie pop-up and that privacy policy on your website. Yes. Okay, so let's recap really fast because I know we've been at this for a hot minute, but this is a really important episode. The Website Planning Series Part 2 Nonprofit Web Building Checklist. First and foremost, review your audience, review your organization's goals. Make sure your website is built to reach those goals. You're going to create a website plan. We do this in a Google Doc. Outline your pages. Figure out how you're going to use your photos and what style they're going to be. Ask yourself what types of content do you update frequently. Make sure that on that website plan document, you list out what's going to be on every page. Talk about the functionality of each page. As you're building that um, content that you can update, use programming to build it in a streamlined fashion so that way you can update it easily. You're going to research the integrations with the platforms you want to use and make sure they actually work. ADA compliance is something that you work on first, and so is SEO. Make sure you make those decisions ahead of time. All right, so then you're moving into team role decisions, right? In order to get the work done, we have to make sure that our team is all on the same page about how it's going to happen. So decide who needs to be involved in your decision-making process. Choose the person who's going to be the project leader. Decide who's going to write your content, who's going to update stuff, and who will do the technical maintenance and keep your software up to date. Then you'll decide on your timeline, and then you'll make your technical decisions, making sure that your website is mobile friendly, that it loads quickly. You'll think about what browsers you most want to optimize it on, especially if they're older, antiquated browsers. Um, Buy a domain, make sure it has an SSL certificate, choose a great hosting provider, get that cookie notification on there, and make sure that you have a privacy policy. Boom. Woo, that is a comprehensive list, friends. And you have been with us and stuck through this whole thing 
Thank you so much. I can't tell you how much better I feel having told you all of this stuff about website design. I really feel like you are ready to go on and start talking about what's going to be on the individual pages of your site. And so really, that's what we're going to talk about next. And we promise that not every episode is going to be this long. No. But it's the planning is so important. I'm the planner. You can tell. I like to plan. I think it makes the whole process go smoothly. Next time, we're going to talk about your homepage. Yay, because your homepage is the first thing people are probably going to see. So we'll break that down for you in our website planning series, part three, what to put on your homepage. All right, so last thing, friends, if you enjoyed this episode and maybe you learned a thing or two, then please, please, please go out and review us in whatever application you're listening in. You can review us in Spotify and Amazon Music, even over in iTunes. That helps other organizations find this same information because you're not the only one who is going through this website building and redesign process. And we want to help as many people as we can. As a matter of fact, our goal is to help over a thousand nonprofits this year have less stressful and more successful marketing and you can help us get there just by leaving a nice review, not a nasty review, a nice review. (laughs) And sharing it with your friends. Oh yeah, share it with your friends. So once again, thank you so much for sticking with us. And until next time, go forth and market with purpose. Bye friends.